Hey everybody, Quantum here, and in this video I thought I would revisit Sapphire Steel. If you watched my previous video that I made on this deck right when Ursula's Return was kind of still new, I opted for a build without Whole New Worlds, focused on smashes and more copies of Grab Your Swords in order to deal with the high number of Emerald decks that were running around in the format, and that performed quite well for me because inherently you do have a lot of card draw and you shouldn't really need to rely on a Whole New World. But maybe in higher levels of gameplay, the whole new world advantage that you can generate is just too good to pass up. So in this version, and the deck list is probably linked in the, in the description and pinned in the comments, I've opted for a different build, obviously using things like One Jump and A Whole New World, things that I've opted not to use uh, in my other version of Sapphire Steel. But in this version, we are running a very high number of uninkables, at least for the Sapphire Steel deck, uh, in 18, which I think is high. Usually I like to stick a, a below 14. Uh, but what you're going to see in this particular matchup is quite ridiculous, um, so I think I think it's worth watching out here. Uh, but right on time we get the Baboom, which represents great value for us here because that Flynn Rider would definitely be able to run away with the lore if we didn't have removal for it. And I'm not running smashes in this build, um, but again, there's just a lot of value in, in running things like that, I think. Um, so I probably would prefer running smash than not. So here we actually miss an ink because our hand is full of uninkables, which is rather ridiculous. And again, go ahead and look at that deck list. I'm only running like two copies of Grab Your Swords, and then everything else is pretty much standard ratios. Um, but we're just getting really unlucky with these draws. Thankfully, the Hiram uh, Pop draws us into two inkables, so we have to ink the um, Tamatoa. And I'm thinking, like, I can let this Queen's Castle survive for one turn. Um, we're about to draw our third whole new world, and I put that to the bottom of the deck in order to draw the Popsicle. And the longer that I go without casting a whole new world, the higher risk I have of drawing into multiple copies. Um, so that is something to take into consideration, but we haven't, we haven't really had an opportunity to play the whole new world, in my opinion. Let me know if you think I misplayed at any point that resulted in me getting into this situation here. Uh, so we draw yet another uninkable, and I'm like, okay, at least I have the Hiram on field that can quest and pop an item to draw two. Uh, we draw into yet another whole new world off of that, I don't, I don't even know if it, if it was a pop school or a Fortisphere, I think it was a Fortisphere there. So all four copies of my whole new world have been seen in the first like 25 cards of my deck, right? I put one to the bottom with the Gramatala, and then I drew into three others. After mulliganing away one of the two that I opened with, I believe, too, right? Like... I don't know if it's just my luck, but this happens to me all the time when I run high number of uninkables. Uh, I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Let me know in the comment section below um, if, I, if you think I'm playing this incorrectly. Uh, anyways, the opponent is going to continue to drop some threats. Our hand is huge compared to our opponents, but we can't really do too much, right, given the limited number of interactions that we can cast uh, per turn because we haven't seen a fishbone quill. Uh, we are stuck on low number of inks without any real ramp like we did play one one jump ahead Which did help us a little bit, but you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in this position here The opponent goes for a really awkward play. I see a lot of players do this and I don't think this is correct in Mim Foxing back your Medusa to use at a later point I think the Mim Fox should definitely just be kept and used in a, in, a, in, a, in a game state where you know You get the immediate benefit holding that Tremaine or uh, Madame Medusa doesn't really do too much for you there, I don't think. Uh, anyways, we do draw into a Tamatoa, and I don't want to ink it, so you see me hard cast one jump, and then just cast the Grab Your Swords, because I'm like, well, at this point, I don't really know what else to do. I don't want to waste my Zeus, because we know that the opponent could be on another copy of Queen's Castle, and I need to save the Zeus for that, potentially. Um, they're going to go ahead and ink Dolores and start dropping goats here, and I'm like, okay. they got three cards left in hand. They drop a Sisu and then quest with their own Sisu going to 9. So I draw, man, I draw another uninkable. I'm like, dude, am I playing like 30, 30 uninkables here? Like, I don't know, 18 doesn't really seem like that much. I don't even get this unlucky when it comes to uh, Sapphire Ruby. And I play like, and I played that deck with 24 uninkables before. Uh, regardless though, we're going to use Tinkerbell to take out the Mimfox, deal 2 damage to the Ready Up CC, and then hard cast yet another Grab Your Swords to wipe out everything but the Goat. And I think that that was probably the, the, the best play. The opponent here is definitely the aggressor though, especially with these Goats. They're probably going to look to cycle. And here, I mean, this is a good tell that their hand isn't the greatest. They're kind of forced to put out some kind of interaction in that Medusa they brought back to hand. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Uh, you waste your Medusa there. You have no other real solid play. Um, I would have probably just passed on nothing, to be honest. Um, but yeah, because they make that weak play, 
I'm happy to use, well, one of my Zeus since I just top decked another one to take it out, knowing that they don't have a location to play right now. Uh, but we do finally draw the Fishbone Quill, and now we're going to be able to aggressively ramp with all these uninkables in our hand. The opponent drops yet another Goat, and I'm like, okay, this is a bit of a problem. They ink the Brawl that they were probably holding onto for a while, and then drop a Merlin Rabbit. So they're in top deck mode. They, they, they probably know that we're on a whole new world because of how many cards are in our hand. So, you know, they, they played this correctly, I think, in dumping their hand out, leaving the two cards that have... Uh, sticky abilities in the goat and the rabbit on field so that if they do get wiped they do get advantage off of it so i'm not going to hold new world yet i'm going to drop this tamatoa and then just pass um yeah they do have two cards in hand i do have this whole new world that i still don't even know if i want to cast it yet um, but they are threatening a decent amount of lore here because of the goat and the potential cycle of goat so they're going to quest with both go to 14 and then they're bouncing goat to go back to go up to 15. Now I know that they inked one goat and I outed another one. So this is their third goat, which means they have a fourth one likely still in their deck. I have to be wary of. Um, but on 15 lore and these three characters on board, I have to definitely make some critical decisions here. Otherwise, your opponent is going to be able to close this game out very quickly. So we're going to go ahead and ink this Tinkerbell. And I'm going to use the Zeus to take out the Readied Rabbit. But I'm going to crash my Tamatoa into the Tap Rabbit first because I want to force these draws, and then I'm probably going to hard cast Whole New World. Um, so this is the only real way that I can generate some sort of advantage, I think, and maybe get back into this game because I'm only on two lore, and the opponent is very close to closing out the game. And this gets rid of the third goat, which is one of the main reasons why I'm doing this. It gets rid of a Dolores and a Friends and another car. I think it was a Chernobyl Followers there. Um, so that's decent value for me. Um, and then. I do have to be wary of be prepared, but given that I haven't seen one yet, I'm like, the opponent either isn't on them or they're just on like one or two copies. So I guess it's okay for me to go a little wide here, given that my hand is pretty decent in a Hiram and double Tamatoa and a Lucky Dime. So I kind of got a really good draw there off of the whole new world. Um, potentially, I should say. not. It's not a necessarily a, an absolutely great hand. It depends on what the opponent has, because if they drew into like three be prepareds, uh, I, would just, I would definitely just lose this game. So the opponent um, drops a Maui to take out the Tamatoa, which is good for me. You know, no be prepared to wipe the board. And then they follow up with a Flynn Rider. And again, that's no problem for me to deal with because I can crash one of my Smees and uh, leave the Smee on board to kind of play around the Flynn Rider, at least for this turn. Now I make an interesting play here in opting to go for the Hiram, which I don't think was necessarily a misplay. I think this is fine. Um, just because you know you want to draw cards and have more options just in case or, or sorry or bait out the be prepared because I don't want to drop these Tamatoas too early and have them get outed uh, because they're essentially my only win condition now or actually you know what no 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 I haven't seen a bell yet and I do that well speak of uh, there it is because uh, I do play two bells and or no, three bells in this build so yeah it's just wild that I bricked up so hard on this uh <laughs> on this game um, when I drew like eight uninkables in a row or something. It was kind of crazy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop Dime and the Bell. Uh, and then, yeah, just go all out, baiting the opponent into be preparing because I can just double Dime, right? If the opponent does have like two be prepared. Uh, double Dime with Tamatoas represents like five, five lore each because I play Tamatoa, I get back a Popsicle, play the Popsicle, Dime for five, and then if they wipe the Tamatoa again, I have a second one for follow-up. So I have game on board no matter what the opponent does unless they have the final goat into bounce. That is the only way I lose. Um, but they opt to sing friends instead of questing here. And this Hades is a little bit of backup um, for me, which is nice to out, you know, a potential threat that could quest for game. Um, and actually, that being said, this this double, yeah, this double fishbone quill is interesting because I don't have enough to play Hades and Tamatoa and Dime, right? So yeah, I was in a little bit of a dicey situation here. Um, the opponent, yeah, makes a very odd decision there in not brawling away the bell. And because of that, uh, I just win the game. I don't know if they just gave up or what there. But yeah, that was a, a very interesting game to come back and win. Um, yeah, they played correctly until the very end there. I'm not sure why. I, my guess is, like I said, they just kind of gave up and knew the game was over. Because either they're not playing Be Prepared or they didn't see it in order to wipe out the board. But yeah, the dime... In that situation, unless they had the goat, it would be kind of impossible to come back from. 
In this next matchup here, we are on the draw against Ruby Amber. So again, another one of these decks that I'm a huge fan of. I think uh, this is a very, very good deck to play in the format. Um, but against Sapphire Steel, can it really overcome the advantage that we generate with the Fishbone Quill? Let's find out. The opponent goes ahead and drops a Flynn Rider. And you see this being used in every single um, Ruby deck. And for that reason, I have seen builds of Sapphire Steel that don't run Mr. Smee. And I'm definitely thinking that Mr. Smee is a, is a is, I don't want to say a must, but like he's a really good option because this is like the second match in a row where playing Mr. Smee has mitigated the lore gain off of a Flynn Rider, especially in the early game. Like, and that's super important. Um, yeah, this card being used in all Ruby decks, like you need something to offset like the Flynn Rider Sisu or, or something like that, because this card can definitely do a lot of damage to you in the early game. Um, so yeah, we, we dropped a Mr. Smee, the, they, they dropped Gaston, and now they have access to a turn 6 play on turn 4. So they're going to go ahead and use Gaston and hard cast a Mufasa instead, so not playing a 6 drop, um, like a Madame Medusa, which would out the Smee here. But the Smee is going to once again offset the lore gain from the Flynn Rider. Now I do have the option to crash the Smee into the Flynn Rider here, which is a consideration. I drop Hiram and draw two. And yeah, I have a bit of a difficult decision. Okay, so the Fishbone Quill is going to ink the one jump and I'm going to hard ink the um, Cogsworth. And what I'm debating here is, do I opt to take out the Gaston here? or the Flynn Rider. Um, because taking out the Flynn Rider here might seem like a no-brainer, but that Gaston giving them cost and advantage to play two turns ahead, I think is just too detrimental to leave on board. So I'm like, I can live with a one-time gain of um, get them getting three lore and then questing, um, because I can probably drop this Tamatoa next turn and offset anything that the opponent has in terms of strength. Unless they drop, well, yeah, well, at least for the next turn. And then even if they drop a Maui, I should hopefully be able to deal with it in some way or another. Uh, the Hiram quest gets me into a Tinkerbell and a Dime, which is interesting here. We're going to use Fishbone on the Gramatala and then drop the Tinkerbell to, de to deal one damage to everything. Now, again, unfortunately, the opponent did drop a second Gaston. Uh, so after working hard to out that first one, you know, giving up that three lore off of the Flynn Rider, uh, they do have a potential to, again, play two turns ahead. They ink the evasive Pegasus, and let's see if they opt to use the Gaston. They got three cards in hand. This Tinkerbell, you know, dropping it, I guess, in hindsight, is kind of a mistake. Because if they have a Rapunzel, they can crash something into the Hiram Rapunzel draw two. Um, so yeah, in hindsight, you got to be very aware of, deal, of leaving open damage on the opponent's characters when you're going up against Amber. So the opponent does use the Gaston, uh, and they're going to go ahead and drop a Surfer Stitch. And this is, again, that what I'm talking about in letting the opponent play two turns ahead. Then they're going to be able to quest to go to 10. And now I have a 4-8 body to deal with, which is really rough. We draw a Gramatala here, and yeah, I'm in, a, I'm in a very odd position. So I'm going to use Fishbone on the Gramatala, and then probably quest with Hiram in order to draw two. Um, because my, my hand right now to deal with the opponent's board isn't too great. Um, and I, I don't want to ink this dime. I want to get it into the graveyard to potentially get it back with um, a Tamatoa later on. So I, go, I do get a second Tinkerbell here, and I drop that knowing that the opponent likely is not on a Rapunzel right now. But they did just draw two off of that Surfer Stitch. So again, kind of dangerous. Uh, we're going to use Tinkerbell uh, and just trigger the Mufasa. They get a Pongo off the top. And that's actually not the worst for me uh, because I'm like, yeah, if they want to pay two ink to get a character to the hand, I can, you know, that's just loss of tempo for them and more ability for me to get more advantage off of this whole new world in my hand. Um, they, they, they are the aggressor in this match, right? They have the ability to put a lot of pressure on me with that Surfer Stitch. Um, it is questing for two and it's a huge body that's going to be pretty difficult to out. Um, so I have to be a little careful here. My Hiram isn't getting isn't threatened right now which is really good uh, unless they opt to drop a maui here to take it out uh, but they do have to worry about these double tinkerbells getting uh, some pretty good value so they do indeed drop the maui unfortunately they got three cards left in hand and now i'm like okay it really depends on what they take out here they go for the tinkerbell um and then they're going to go ahead and quest with both of their characters which is probably a mistake here they definitely should not have quested with the pongo 
because now this Tinkerbell can just crash into the Pongo, which is maybe what they were baiting me to do, but like you, you, you lose your Maui for free here. Um, I don't know, maybe they were just like, well, he probably has a grab your sword, so he's gonna out the stuff anyways. Um, at least this way I force him to use his Tinkerbell to take out characters rather than just get, you know, quests for, for lore. I don't know what they were thinking there. Um, but in the end, their Surfer Stitch does survive. I do have a Hades, double Hades, in order to deal with it, but they are going to get to 15, which is not great. And I really have to manage the board state from here because they're very close to winning the game and I'm very, very far behind. But again, these Sapphire decks don't mind being on very low amounts of lore because you have Bell into Tama or sorry, Bell and Tamatoa with the Lucky Dime in order to really just explode um, your way to victory, basically, <laughs> um, and catch up in the lore count and, and win the game. The opponent drops the Madam Medusa to out the Hiram here. So, okay, that's probably the reason why they didn't opt to take it out with the Maui because they knew they had follow-up. So it made sense to take out the Tinkerbell there. Um, and it's good to see them just pass on nothing. They're on six ink. Uh, and at this point, I do have to deal with that Surfer Stitch. So I could double crash my um, Tamatoa and my Tinkerbell into it. But losing the Tinkerbell there and then getting a lot of damage on the Tamatoa just doesn't feel great because then they could just Madame Medusa challenge the Tamatoa to out it. So we just opt to play a little bit more passively here um, and, you know, get the items, getting the, getting the items back with the Tamatoa, I think is definitely the correct play. Yes, the opponent can go to 16, but we're not too threatened by them closing out the game just yet. Again, depending on what they drop on board, I do have the second Hades and this uh, Grab Your Swords in my back pocket, as well as if they quest with the Madame Medusa, I do have the Tinkerbell ready to go. Okay, something unexpected comes down in that Scar, and I'm like, holy crap, is that ever good value for them? Uh, so they're able to deal a lot of damage to the Tamatoa, and thankfully it does take out the Scar, and this is gonna use up their turn, and then the Madame Medusa clears the, the Tamatoa again. We top deck another whole new world, so we're going to ink that immediately. Uh, I make a huge misplay here. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that I didn't have enough to activate the dime with the bell, so I definitely should have just played the dime and activated it on the, the Hades and not played the bell, because now I'm just asking to get, um, uh, yeah, medusa away, like having this bell medusa -ed. Thankfully, they don't have one, so I don't really get punished here. The Tremaine uh, comes down and takes out the Hades, or I opt to take out the Hades for it. They follow up with a Pegasus, and now I'm just gonna go ahead and quest with Bell, uh, and then use Dime on Bell, drop Hades in order to take out the Tremaine, and the opponent scoops it up knowing that we have game next turn.